And a very good morning to you. I hope you're well this Sunday morning. It's a nice one here in South Manchester. It's the 29th of April, 2018. It is quite nice and bright and uh, dry. It's been a kind of a mixed weekend. Uh, this is Sunday View. Welcome to it. Thanks for tuning in and giving up some of your Sunday to listen to moi, to listen to me. You can contact me, of course, during the course of the next hour or nearly the next hour by tweeting at Richie Allen Show. That's my Twitter handle. Tweet at Richie Allen Show. Let me know what you're thinking. And um, got some interesting things to talk about this morning. Asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on RichieAllen.co.uk. Fab Radio 2 in Manchester and TriggerWarning.tv. Sure, when is it not interesting? We'll be looking closely at some of the big stories in the Sunday newspapers, of course, looking at the Sunday morning talk shows as well. Fab Radio 2, TriggerWarning.tv, RichieAllen.co.uk. This is your Sunday View. It's the Richie Allen Show, broadcasting live on RichieAllen.co.uk and multiple platforms around the world. And now, here's your host, Richie Allen. Welcome to the program. Base Ninja has just tweeted me. He said, I saw the threat made against you by some geezer. For feck's sake, I hope you sent it to the 5-0. No, I didn't. But I'll talk a little bit about it later on. It's not that consequential. I'm not important. I never have been, ever. The information has always been and will always be the star on this program. Not individual personalities. But yes... People associated with other people, whom I've been very critical of, posted an address on Twitter the other day and suggested that somebody come and pay me a visit. (laughs) Roll up, I say. Come and see me and take your chances. You'll be very surprised at what you meet when you get here. Right, it's two minutes past the hour. Enough of all of that nonsense. This is Sunday View. Hope you're well. Hope you've had a good weekend thus far. And uh, you're in fine fettle. You might be working. In fact, I do get messages from people who say, Richie, we work on Sundays and uh, we listen on Sunday in work. Anyway, if you are working and you are listening, I hope your weekend is going okay. Anyway, let me say hi to Dave and Nathan from the Sex Pistols Experience who are travelling through Sweden today, part of their Scandinavian tour. And they sent me, well, Dave sent me a message yesterday to say that he would be tuned in this morning. Sex Pistols Experience, whom I tragically missed when they were in Manchester recently at the Academy. I'm looking forward to catching the band in the future because I'm a big fan of New York Dolls, The Clash, The Pistols, these types of bands, and I'd love to see them. So guys, if you're travelling through Sweden, it's well to be you. I hope you're having a good time and I hope the tour is going swimmingly. All right, all right. So what's make, before we look at the front pages of the headlines, excuse me, the headlines on the front pages of the newspapers, Big stories being covered today, the North Korean meeting, the meeting of minds, the physical meeting between the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un and his South Korean counterpart, uh, counterpart, right, there were some friends over last night and I had a lot to drink, <laughs> I'm going to be honest about it, and I, it, it went into the very small hours of the morning and at one stage I didn't think I'd make it, but I made it, I'm here, so there might be a mispronunciation here or there. Uh, during the course of this programme. A little bit peaked. I'm a little bit jaded this morning. Anyway, so they met the respective leaders on the peninsula, met on Friday. And what has come out of that, reports the BBC, is that North Korea's nuclear test site will close and it will happen next month. Donald Trump is delighted with this. He's been saying that within the next few weeks he expects to hold talks, not a meeting, but hold talks with the North Korean leadership over the denuclearization of the peninsula. All well and good, but why don't you dispense with your nuclear weapons as well, Mr. President, and your Israeli pals who don't even acknowledge that they have nuclear weapons? Why don't we all get rid of our nuclear weapons once and for all? All right, all right. Also in the news today, the Windrush story that just will not go away. This is crazy stuff. It's, it's so ridiculous, this story. Obviously not for the people involved. All right, if you came to the country as part of the Windrush generation 1948 to 1971 from the Caribbean, and if you have found it difficult to access certain services because you can't prove your citizenship, it's obviously a serious story for them. 
But Jesus Christ just emailed these people with a document they can download guaranteeing their citizenship. Not only those people, but their children and their grandchildren. And be fucking done with it. Once and for all. It's ridiculous to have this much going on about this story. But of course, there's always a real story in the background. And the real story is they want to attack the notion that any government should target genuinely illegal migrants. That's what they want to go after. Because the last thing in the world, the cabal, the hidden hand, whatever you want to call them, the last thing in the world they want is immigration to stop. Okay? And that's what it's about. These people are legitimately here. This is a non-story for the rest of us, but for them it is a story. Give them the and documents and be done with it. Today, email them. Look, bang, there you go. Print that off. And if anybody says to you, are you entitled to be here, Mr. and Mrs. Jones or Mr. and Mrs. Smith, whose who, who's, who's lineage goes back to Barbados, yes, we fucking are. Here's the document. And be done with it. Drives me mad, that. By the way, I want to acknowledge, um, and, and, and this is not virtue signalling, and this is not pathos, but we talked a bit about Alfie Evans last week, the young boy with the degenerative neurological condition. He passed away over the weekend. Um, must be a terrible time for his parents, who probably didn't, um, n- I suppose, the public interest and the press interest came about because they wanted to take him to Italy. But I would imagine that it was a very intrusive time for them, much as they needed a press. And I suppose now they'll just want to be left alone. But the boy, the young boy did pass away. There will be a lot of questions, of course, in the coming weeks and months about the rights of parents to do what they think is in the best interest of their own children. And you know I've got some very strong opinions about that, and I'm sure you do as well. So um, God love his family and the families of any, uh, any families who lose um, young children who, who, who die because of illness or die suddenly. It's unimaginable. I don't have children, so I can't imagine it. But for those who have children, you know, I know you'll have a... You, you know, you, it, it, when you hear about children dying like that, I suppose it's um, it has a special meaning for, for those who have children. The Mail on Sunday, before we look at the headlines, has, a, has a, an unusual story. And it's about a, a, a 63 and a 65-year-old man and woman who are together, husband and wife. They had a baby through a surrogate mother. Let me read you the first couple of paragraphs of the story lest I twist it up and make a mess of it, because I am, as I said, a bit under the weather this this morning, excuse me. I've had a lot of water. That's not alcohol. A couple who have become Britain's oldest parents through use of a surrogate mother at the ages of 63 and 65 are devastated after the baby was taken away by social services. The parents' age is reportedly thought to be a factor in concerns over their one-year-old's well-being. Social services first spoke with the couple who are from the north of England last year and warned them that they had to make improvements to how their child was being cared for. This is according to The Sun. The adoptive parents spent more than £100,000 on the surrogate mother, who was in her 30s. So they're obviously very wealthy people. It is believed, writes the Mail on Sunday, that she was impregnated using the 65-year-old father's sperm and a donor egg. The child's British birth mother and her husband were named on the birth cert, but they signed a parental order letting the older couple adopt the baby. Social services were closely monitoring the situation and decided to take the child away after concerns were raised. The infant is in foster care. The adoptive parents continue to fight for custody. They have failed in one bid but are allowed some contact in monitored visits. We've heard this before. A source said this is an unusual situation. Although it is upsetting for all, social workers have done what they think is best for the child. Right? You see, huge, hugely problematic this. I don't know about the case, so I can't really comment on it. The adoptive mother refused to comment and the council refused to comment as well. If it's solely about the age of the parents. That's a very dangerous thing, isn't it? Because at what point does the state say you are too old now to care for a child? 
very interested in this. And Caroline said something to me, something to me the other day. She said, um, Rachel Weiss, is it her voice, who's married to, is it Daniel Craig, the James Bond actor? She's pregnant now, is Rachel Weiss. She's 48, I think. And uh, Caroline said, look, it's never too late for us, <laughs> right? Caroline will be 40 next month. I'm 43. I wonder at what point this crazy lunatic asylum, this um, dystopian paradigm we live in, at what point will the rulers, the authorities say, well, you're not allowed to have children after a certain age? Listen, there could be other issues with respect to the 63-year-old woman and 65-year-old man. I don't know. And it would be unfair to assume that it's just about the age. But the Sun newspaper, which I don't read, and the Mail on Sunday, which covered the Sun's story, they say it is about the age. Dangerous, isn't it? Eh? Isn't it dangerous? Right. And wholly predictable. Let's have a look at the Sunday Mirror. Load of virtue signalling today. Sajid Javid's wind rush fury. It could have been me, my mum, or my dad. So he's the community's secretary. So he's a government top man, government minister, Sajid Javid. And he's told the Sunday Telegraph that his own family could have been caught up in the Windrush scandal, so please don't hold this against the Conservatives. It could have been me. It could have been my family. Virtue signalling. Again, just say that anybody who came from the West Indies, Barbados, Jamaica, in that period, Dominica, whatever, emailed them papers and their offspring be done with it. But they're attacking now the notion that seeking out illegal immigrants is wrong morally and somehow harassing of people. It isn't. Full stop. If there are people who shouldn't be here, they should be asked to leave. If they can prove that by being sent home, their lives will be in danger, that's a different story entirely. And you have a moral oblig obligation then to look after them, I would have said. Right? And I'm not being a, you know, I'm not being a lefty or, it, it's just, it's, it's right and proper. This guy shouldn't be here, he's got no papers. Right, okay. But if he has to go back to wherever he originally came from and we know that something bad is going to happen to him there, you can't send him back. It's as simple as that. The Mail on Sunday, front page headline. Tory whip destroyed file on sex probe MP. This is about Charlie Elphick, who is accused of um, sexual misconduct. He denies it. He's an MP. He denies it strongly. But um, it, it's been alleged that the chief whip of the Conservative Party, Julian Smith, um, destroyed a complaint that was made against Charlie Elphick, destroyed the, not the evidence of it, but, but a file with, with allegations in it, basically. Both of them deny any wrongdoing. There's not much I can say about that, so we'll move on. The Sunday Times has that hilarious story. It wouldn't be a Sunday without a bit of Russian baiting, a bit of bear baiting. <laughs> Um, when you think of bears, you think of Vladimir Putin, don't you? Um, Sunday Times, ridiculous story on the front page. The headline is, Exposed, Exposed, Exposed! Russians tried to swing election for Corbyn. Once again, Exposed! Russians tried to swing election for Corbyn. This is hilarious. Sunday Times is saying that they found evidence of Russian interference in last year's general election. The report says that robot Twitter accounts rooted for Labour and attacked the Tories. And they're saying that these accounts came out of Russia. There were thousands of them and nine out of ten of them were posting pro-Labour Party articles and stuff like that. This is just bullshit. It's just monumental bullshit. And I've read the article and to read the Sunday Times you've, you, you're allowed to read one or two articles a week, but then you've got to pay for all the rest of them. Um, so you can read it online if you want. It's very, very thin on evidence and it is very thick, in fact, bursting with hyperbole. Little or no evidence there. 14 minutes past the hour. This is Sunday View. This is Sunday View. Good morning to Paul Paranoid. <laughs> Good morning, mate. Um... Base Ninja says, will the Korea situation lead to the Koreans asking the US to remove its military from the peninsula or is this a ploy 
by North Korea to get sanctions removed? That's a very good question uh, from Base Ninja because the sanctions have obviously hurt North Korea very badly. There's no doubt about it. In case you don't know, the economic sanctions on North Korea are pretty much enforced by the Chinese at the behest of uh, the Americans. That's a good question. Pure cinema, Richie, says David Stanford. Possibly, David, because many, many moons ago, <laughs> no pun intended, the North Korean leadership did meet with the South Korean leadership. There was a lot of glad handing and smiles then, but nothing came out of it. Cartoon Drunk tweets, the only wind rush Amber Rudd will be feeling at the moment is the one coming out of her backside. Very good. Uh, good morning to Gail. Good morning to Mr. Mojo. Um, oh yes, that article is interesting. Yes, I'm going to get into that when I come back from my halls, don't you know. Good morning to Colm in Dublin. Morning, Colm. And thanks for, for, the, for the meme. Really appreciate, appreciate that. Lance Burkett as well. Uh, Robert and Mark, everybody who's tweeting in and listening to the programme, it's nice to have your company this fine spring morning, 16 minutes past 11. Shall we talk uh, about the front page headline on The Observer then? Sadiq Khan tells Rudd to quit as crisis threatens Tory poll hope. Sadiq Khan is the Mayor of London, he's a Labour MP, and he's written in The Observer that Andrew... Excuse me, Amber Rudd even, Andrew. I told you, it was a rough night. Amber Rudd should resign. And uh, Sunday Observer reckons the Windrush story might cause problems for the Conservative Party in next week's local election, which is on Thursday next week, isn't it? I won't be voting, of course. I don't vote in elections. They're a nonsense, of course. But it's been alleged that this particular issue might hurt the Conservatives. But it's also being alleged that accusations of anti-Semitism might in fact hurt the Labour Party, yeah. And also on the front page of the Observer is a great um, Hunger Games Society story. The headline is simple. It says, Dramatic Fall in Home-Owning Young Families. But of course, that's a long-term plan of the hidden hand of the cabal, that people won't own anything. They won't own property. They will be dependent on every aspect of their lives, dependent on the state. Of course. Lot of royal wedding stuff in the other papers, which is an absolute nonsense. So that's it for the front pages of the papers. 17 and a half minutes past the hour. If you've got to be somewhere, you've probably still got time. Take me with you. Uh, Brexit in the papers and the Lord's Amendments. This is the unelected House of Lords, which is full of remoners, which is going to scupper Brexit. A lot of stories in the papers today suggesting that Theresa May is going to have to agree to staying in the customs union and that she won't be able to get the EU withdrawal bill through or past the House of Lords without conceding to the customs union. It's all over the papers today, along with allegations that Jacob Rees-Mogg would lead some sort of rebellion and bring the government down over this customs union. Of course, we said after the referendum on the 24th of June 2016, I told you, with no joy, with no joy, there would be no Brexit. It's never going to happen. It's all over the papers today. David Davis is saying that we will be leaving the Customs Union. Don't believe all this nonsense. So is Theresa May. Here's the Daily Mail's Andrew Pierce. Andrew Pierce is a staunch Brexiteer like your presenter. He's a staunch Brexiteer. He was on the Andrew Marr sofa today, as was Caroline Lucas from the Green Party, and they talked about all of these amendments and the customs union. Andrew Pearce and Caroline Lucas. But I interviewed David Davis for the Daily Mail in the Mail yesterday, and he was quite clear, and he said in no uncertain terms, we are leaving the customs union. It was in the Conservative Party manifesto. Tory MPs won their election on that manifesto, so he's not interested in this so-called... Uh, Customs arrangement. Yeah. Customs but, but arrangement. But if we do leave the customs union, then the impact on peace in Northern Ireland, the impact on the economy is going to be a nightmare. And more and more Tory MPs know that. And they've got more problems coming up for them. This is a, 
more on, on this from the Sunday Telegraph about these two amendments that are coming up uh, next week ah, in the Lords. Can Lord. you explain to me how these work, Caroline? Because <laughs> I don't understand. Oh dear. Right. Well, you'll know that the Prime Minister has promised MPs that they will have a meaningful vote in yeah. October on the, on the deal. And the problem is that it's not meaningful if what the vote actually is, is, well, do you like this deal or not? And if the or not means then we're out. It's My like the devil the and the deep blue. Yeah. See, exactly. So very rightly, I think, peers are trying to ensure that MPs would have the opportunity to amend that deal or at least to tell them to go back and and renegotiate it or get it better in my view what they should be doing at that point is going to the country to have a, a people's vote on that final deal because I think it ought to go back to the people they started this process now they've seen all the mm -hmm. information they may well have different views about it and it would be democratic yeah, for them so, to go so, back and have a look so, at it so speaks the voice of someone who hasn't accepted the referendum result of which yes. there are a lot of people in Westminster we're talking about the deal no, there's two no, different no, no, things no, 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 Andrew. this is an two agenda this things. is an agenda to scupper Brexit no, completely and one of these amendments is trying to say Parliament should carry on the negotiations rather than the Prime Minister very difficult very good stuff from Andrew Pierce of course it's an agenda to bring it down and sadly it is going to bring it down. And for our overseas listeners who might sometimes get a bit pissed off listening to Brexit on the Richie Allen Show, the reason this is the biggest story of the last three, four years is in order for the cabal to achieve absolute lockdown, complete control, it needs a one world government. And these unions, political and economic and military union of dozens and dozens of countries is essential to the cabal. And they can't allow countries like the UK walk away and thrive by taking back control of her waters, by taking back control of its right to do deals with other countries around the world that favours it, its right to start manufacturing again, its right to bail out steelworks and companies like Tata Steel to stop them from going under, its right to end anti-competitive practices. That's why people chose to leave the European Union. That is why it is a massive issue. And people should never get tired of hearing about it. Even though I suppose I'm contradicting myself here in terms because I'm saying on the one hand it's very important and on the other hand I'm saying it's never going to happen. It would happen if people got up off their arses and said to their government and to their local politicians it ain't, you're finished. If we don't leave completely, 100%, customs union everything, you're out of a job. As people contacted their MPs when David Cameron wanted to secure the parliamentary support to bomb Syria. People in their hundreds of thousands contacted their MPs and said, we will fuck you so hard you'll think it's an elephant doing it to you if you vote to bomb Syria. What did the MPs do? They said, shit, we better not agree to bomb Syria then. The European Union is essential. It is the biggest pillar of a future one global state, which is complete lockdown. That's a fact. It's huge. And of course, Andrew Pierce on of the Daily Mail on the Andrew Marsh was absolutely right to say that to her. Completely anti-democratic. Refusing to accept the result of the people. Incidentally, Liberal Democrat leader Vince Cable was also on the programme this morning. What a miserable old bollocks he is, Vince Cable. He was asked by Andrew Marr, did he still believe that the people who voted leave did so because they're just a bunch of little racists? Um, I mentioned at the top of the programme that you made uh, quite a striking intervention in your speech to the Liberal Democrat yeah. conference in March. I'd just like to remind people of what you said. You're talking about the Brexit vote. Mm. You said, I thought the public have voted to be poorer. Mm. That is their right. Mm. What's changed my mind is the evidence that Brexit was overwhelmingly the choice of the older generation. Too many were driven by a nostalgia for a world where passports were blue, faces were white and the map was coloured imperial pink. Mm. That sounds as if you're accusing Brexit voters of being racists. Some probably have that uh, attitude. So you, you think the Brexit but, so, but vote not was all. tinged no, by no, racism? The, the simple point I was making was that the Brexit vote was very heavily influenced by age. You know, younger people overwhelmingly voted to remain, older people overwhelmingly voted to leave. And there were different motives. I mean, you know, some good reasons, some bad reasons. But, I mean, after all that we've experienced in the last few weeks around the immigration debate, I mean, the, the, the ugly truth is that race has been a key factor in British politics. I was simply making this quite explicit. Of course, large numbers of older people voted Brexit for what they thought were very good reasons. Nothing but some to do voted with because they some, were racist. Some undoubtedly were, were concerned with 
looking back to a, a world where immigration was not an issue in the way. Yeah, you see, if Andrew Marr was any good, if he was any good of a, a, a journalist, and he isn't, he's not a good interviewer. He's a terrible interviewer. When Cable said some old people did vote for good reasons, Marr should have immediately jumped on him and said, what, what are those good reasons that older people voted to leave for? And put Cable right on the spot. Of course, he would have started stuttering and stammering. To which point Mark could have said, no, no, you're going to answer the question. You said some of them are racist, but some of them voted for what they thought were good reasons. What were the good reasons they thought they were voting leave for? Right? Taking back control of your borders. Deciding that it's not a good thing to allow tens of thousands of unskilled or, no, or, or semi-skilled workers coming in from European countries. Taking jobs that we could give to unskilled or semi-skilled British people, maybe. Maybe that's why they voted to leave. Maybe those tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of unskilled, semi-skilled people, maybe they came in here and maybe they worked off the books. Maybe they worked for money under the table. Maybe they worked for less than the minimum wage. God love them. I don't blame them. Of course, we don't blame them. I've said this a million times on the programme. We blame the bosses. We blame the, the, the politicians that allowed it to happen. Maybe that's why they voted. Race has got nothing to do with that. Maybe they voted to end the destruction of uh, the countryside. Maybe they voted to, 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 to end the fact that British fishermen can't fish in their own waters. Maybe uh, they voted for that, maybe. Anyway, did Cable have anything else to say of any note? It's an issue in the way it is today. Mm -hmm. And you, the way you phrase that implies that you think because of that, the Brexit referendum result wasn't in some sense legitimate. Well, it was legitimate. It happened. I mean, I'm not trying to reopen the Brex the referendum. It's happened. We're living with the consequences. Of what a liar. I'm not trying to reopen the referendum. What a lying little bastard Cable is. Cable is desperate for a second referendum. Consequences of it. Um, but the view I and my party take is we have no idea at the moment what Brexit's going to look like. I mean, all kind of things could happen. Yeah, yeah. Cable is the greatest liar that ever walked the face of the earth. Him and, and Nick Clegg, who told millions of UK students that tuition fees would end if you vote us into power. They formed a coalition with the Tories and they reneged on the central promise of their uh, manifesto. Fucking liars. What a... Jesus Christ. Right, um, yes, I'm in fine form. Andy Newman, good morning, Andy. Why didn't Vince Cable vote to leave then, Richie? He's an older git than me. I voted out for political and economic reasons. Cheers for that, Andy. Uh, good morning to John Smith uh, about the uh, about Brexit. This is bollocks. I'm from Northern Ireland, Richie. Brexit is nothing to do with peace. Absolutely right. On young people not owning their own houses, David Stanford quite rightly tweets, in my opinion, Richie, if you don't own, it will cut down the legal complications, forcing people into mega cities. Absolutely spot on. And Stephen Lash, it's been a while since I heard from Stephen. Good morning, Steve. Richie, I actually feel sorry for Elmer Fudd. She's being used as a human shield for Theresa May. That's a good point as well, because May was the Home Secretary when the landing cards, when the, well, they weren't given landing cards, but when um, documentation about the Windrush generation was burned, effectively, or shredded. Uh, so that's a very good point, that, yeah. Um, that, that, that in and of itself is, should be enough to see the back of Theresa May and maybe Amber Rudd, but Theresa May. But when you think that Theresa May, a criminal, somebody who admitted her crimes on national television, a criminal who admitted that um, she, t she, she, she took the position to, when she was Home Secretary, to appoint Elizabeth Butler Sloss and Fiona Wolfe as heads of the child abuse inquiry, knowing that they were personally connected to people who had been accused of child abuse. That's called perverting the course of justice. May should have been fired and should have left politics at that immediate, uh, the, the minute that information became public. So uh, the Windrush thing is not going to bring Theresa May down or anything like it. 28 minutes past the hour. Quick break. When we come back, we're going to take a different... Uh, we want to talk a little bit about anti-Semitism. Don't groan. It's in the papers again today. And the Shadow Community Secretary, a guy called Andrew Gwynn, was on the Andrew Marr Show today. And he had some very interesting things to say. 
There's a place high in the mountains of Spain, a sanctuary where souls gather from all around the globe to learn about themselves and experience powerful changes in the way we see our world. They become awakened to their gifts and their power to heal others. Become part of this ever-growing worldwide family of unique, pure energy healing practitioners. Discover how amazing you truly are. Go to www.markbayerski.com. It could just change your life forever. Introducing the H2O app, a powerful water structure and application that programs vibrational energies into water through the use of different sound frequencies. Once programmed, the use of water for drinking, cooking, bathing. Give it to your friends and colleagues or spread it around the garden. The list goes on. It's not just water that the app can be used for either. It's great for programming crystals too. The H2O app is free to download and is available on both Android and Apple platforms. For further information, go to h2oapp.online. Have you lost access to important data from a computer hard drive, mobile phone, or other storage device? Maybe you have a broken hard drive containing years of information, or a smartphone that no longer works from which you'd like the pictures, movies, and chats recovered. If you would like to recover data from any type of digital device, including desktop and laptop computers, external hard drives, cameras, smartphones, NAS, and RAID servers, then contact Data Clinic today at dataclinic.co.uk now. The Richie Allen Show relies on your support. Go to richieallen.co.uk and set up a monthly donation today. Richie Allen. Welcome back. Richie Allen indeed. This is The Richie Allen Show. It's live on Fab Radio 2. Tune in radio triggerwarning.tv, richieallen.co.uk. It's actually Sunday View. Sunday View. And um, what are we? 28 minutes to midday as I do this live. 28 and a half minutes to midday. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for all the tweets. Uh, good to hear from you. Um, let's move on then, like we said. A lot of stuff on anti-Semitism in the papers today. You know that last week Jeremy Corbyn went with the Jewish Leadership Council and the Board of Deputies of British Jews. They weren't happy. They complained. It was a waste of time. It was a wasted opportunity, they said. Now, the Shadow Communities Secretary, front bench, Labour man, colleague of Jeremy Corbyn's Andrew Gwynn was on the Mar show too, the Shadow Community Secretary. Mar asked him, why did the meeting with the Jewish leaders, well, why did it go so badly wrong? Well, I'm not sure it did go badly, Andrew. I think it was the start of a dialogue with the Board of Deputies and the Jewish Leadership Council. Uh, they put forward uh, in uh, a... Uh, frank and fair way to uh, the Labour Party, their views uh, and what they would like to see mm. uh, and Jeremy Corbyn listened and uh, took on board a number of those issues and assurances were given that by the time we next meet, because this is the start of the dialogue, uh, sufficient progress will be made on a number of those issues. Okay, well um, the Board of Deputies and Jewish, Leader Council, Jewish Leadership Council said our meeting with Jeremy Corbyn was a disappointing missed opportunity. He failed to agree any of the concrete actions we raised and Gillian Merrin, chief executive of the Board of Deputies, said the meeting did not go as well as hoped. The leaders team delivered a lot of warm words but little in the way of actions. Can we go through some of the things that they wanted out of this meeting? That, Absolutely. So for instance, would you personally share a platform with somebody who had been expelled from the Labour Party for anti-Semitism? No, and it's been made very clear by Jeremy Corbyn that nobody should be sharing a platform with anybody mm. who has been found guilty of anti-Semitism. That is absolutely clear. Anybody who is expelled so, from the Labour Party, we should not be sharing platforms so that, with these people. So why very did you clear. not write it? I mean, they wanted you to write this into, into your rule book. Why did you not do that? Well, of course, it's very clear already. You, you should not, uh, as a Labour Party member, share a platform mm. with anybody who has been expelled from the Labour Party. Do you see the sort of world that these lunatic progressives these multi what, what what this cultural marxist progressive lunatic like andrew gwynn do you see what they're trying to do this world they're trying to create this hateful horrible world where if you say something or think something they don't agree with you are basically outcast you are cast out you are expelled gone you 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 now become you now become persona non grata 
somebody whom you should not be anywhere near. This is terrifying, this. It really is. I can't overemphasize this. I can't emphasize it enough how important this is, that these people are not allowed to create this world where just because somebody has ideas or opinions that we might find repugnant sometimes, sometimes not, or, or sometimes we just strongly disagree with. You know, this progressive mindset, we will decree that thinking this way is abhorrent. Therefore, you can't even associate with a person who thinks like that. This is incredibly dangerous. It's incredibly dangerous. And it is winning. This fucking nonsense is winning. And I'm going to talk about this in more detail in a minute. I've got some audio. I think you'll find listening. Interesting. This nonsense. There is no anti-Semitism in this country. It's, it's a fantasy. An absolute fantasy. And I've demonstrated that dozens of times on recent programmes and in articles written on richieallen.co.uk. Are there one or two idiots who hate Jews just because they are Jews? Yes! Yes, of course. There are Muppets everywhere. You can't walk down the street without bumping into a Muppet. I might be a Muppet. I am a Muppet. I'm sure there's somebody who would say that, Richie Allen, a Muppet. That neighbour of mine, he's a Muppet. Because he thinks like this or he thinks like that. Fair enough. But we still have to live with one another and get on with one another, don't we? Right? It's just lunacy, this. It really is. And it's very serious. What else did Andrew Marr get out of Andrew Gwynn today? The second thing that they asked for is that you should adopt the internationally agreed definition of anti-Semitism. Now, you've adopted the, the headline agreement, but not lots of the examples that were given after that headline. And again, why not? Well, one of the action points that was agreed was that we want to go further. We've written into the rules the international definition, uh, but in terms of examples, we don't actually think that those examples go far enough. So, for example, in uh, the Chakrabarti report, uh, she uh, highlights the uh, use of the term Zio, and uh, that isn't yes. something that, for example, is included in the examples. We want to work with the Board of Deputies. So you want to go further, well, you're saying? We, we absolutely you... do. We want to work with the Board of Deputies and with the Jewish Leadership Council to write into Labour Party rules uh, a much broader definition uh, of okay. uh, anti-Semitism well, that goes beyond that, including terms like Zio, which quite frankly are abhorrent and insulting. That's really interesting. Can I ask you about some of the examples that they give that they wanted you to include and you, they say you have yeah, just before Andrew Marr gives him the examples that the Jewish leadership wants to be included, but that he hasn't, Zio is not abhorrent. It is an abbreviation of the word Zionist. And being a Zionist is not a nice fucking thing to be. But you know what? What's good for the goose is good for the gander. We must tolerate Zionists. We must not ostracise them, we must not exclude them, we must not say that we would never share a platform with them, even though we find what they stand for to be abhorrent. But they are fucking people as well. Don't agree with you. you know, I don't agree that you think you can just steal the indigenous people of Palestine, you can steal their land, and that it's okay to kidnap their children, and you agree with that, you're not doing it. You're here in the UK, you're not doing it, but I'm going to fucking argue with you. And I'm going to use the term Zionist in a derogatory manner because it's not a nice thing to be. That's my opinion. You can argue with it or you can ignore me. That is your choice. And I'll come back to that in a few minutes when I talk about the independent media and some of the nonsense that's going on in it. About this, you know, about people being criticised for the manner in which they present their information and then losing their shit over that and trying to troll people and all of that. We'll, get, we'll come to that a bit later on. 22 minutes to the top of the hour. How dare this this absolute fool, Gwyn, say that? These are abhorrent words. We're going to write this into legislation. You can't say these words. Yes, we can. Zio is an abbreviation of Zionist. A Zionist is not a nice thing to be. Hating Jews is not a nice thing to be either. Hating blacks is not a nice thing to be. Uh, to be, or it's not a nice thing to aspire to. What are you going to do? How many times have I said this on the programme? What are you going to do about people like that? So long as people are not breaking the law, so long as they are not breaking the law and running around after people, shouting at them and calling them names, what are you going to do? If they think as they think, that's it. There's nothing you can do about it. Can't You can't make thoughts and feelings illegitimate in any society 
really gets my goat this got some brilliant audio for you in a minute you won't believe it um, we're going to hear from the film Porky's do you remember Porky's 1981 crass sex comedy brilliant hilariously funny in parts it's an amazing scene in that film that even better illustrates what I'm trying to say is that I can manage myself more from Andrew Gwynn and Andrew Marr haven't holding Jews collectively responsible for the actions of the state of Israel. You're Jewish, you're responsible for what's going on. Who says that? Who accuses Jewish people in the UK of being responsible for the crimes of the Zionist apartheid state of Israel? Who does that? I don't know anybody who does it. I, and I know people who are vehemently opposed to the Israeli regime and its crimes, really spend all their time writing and talking about it. Never seen them blame UK-based Jews for it. How could you? It's ridiculous. It's intellectually redundant. Most Jews I know, and I know a few in the city, are as much against the government of Israel as, as you are and as I am. And there are a lot of other Jews who just couldn't give a shit. And those Jews who couldn't give a shit about Israel, they represent the majority opinion in the United Kingdom because most people in the UK couldn't give a shit, tragically. But that's the way it is. Right? Right. I'm fed up with this. Let's hear a bit more from Andrew Gwynn and then we'll just move on. It's slightly odd because you're, you're, you know, you're sounding very firm on all of these issues and very clear, but the Board of Deputies got the impression in this meeting that you weren't going to accept these internationally agreed uh, examples and they've been agreed by about 130 British councils, by the Scottish Parliament, the Welsh Assembly, the CPS, the police, and yet not by the Labour Party. Well, by the time of the next meeting, we're meeting again in July after the uh, National Executive Committee meeting uh, in July, um, I hope that we will be able to meet again, go through the progress that has been made because many of the asks that were put forward, uh, it was agreed to take mm. away, for example, to expedite some of the historic cases, particularly the high profile cases um, and uh yeah expedite the high profile cases expedite the high he means Ken Livingston by the way who never said anything that could be construed as hateful towards Jews it's madness this Andrew Gwynn doesn't have a backbone. He is spineless, just like his leader, who should have told the Jewish Board of Deputies and the Council to fuck the fuck off. Be gone. Nonsense. There is no endemic hatred towards Jews in society. This is all about the rabid crimes of the filthy Zionist regime that sits in Tel Aviv and oversees the murder, the torture, the kidnapping and the enslavement of the indigenous people of that country. That's what it's about when people criticise Israel. So get out of my fucking office. There is no anti-Semitism. That's what they should have done, of course. But Corbyn is a coward, as are um, most of the MPs who sit behind him. Oh, if only, do you know my friend and colleague, I say colleague, he's my friend Michael Cohen, who's a absolutely top class gentleman, lives around the corner from me, hugely um, well briefed on geopolitical affairs. Michael said, you know what, Richie, it's a terrible shame that Gerald Kaufman, who was our MP, by the way, until he passed away um, about 18 months ago, Gerald Kaufman used to be, he, he was Jewish, Gerald Kaufman, very, very pro um, Israel man for many years and then visited the occupied territories and came back and became one of the most vocal opponents of the Israeli regime. Um, Jewish man who passed away. Michael said, Jesus Richie, isn't it a terrible, Michael didn't swear, isn't it a terrible shame that Kaufman is not around now because he would not put up with this nonsense. Tony Benn must be spinning in his grave that Labour MPs are falling apart at the fucking seams because a few idiots are claiming that anti-Semitism is endemic. No, it is not. 17 minutes to the top of the year. I'm sweating buckets here. Bacardi, is, not Bacardi, wine is coming out of my pores. Owen Jones, the hysterical little bollocks himself. There's nobody like him. This Guardian journalist, in inverted commas, he's no journalist, uh, Jones, he wrote a ridiculous book um, where he basically took a load of other people's ideas, socialist nonsense, threw it into a book. Um, parole pretender, idiot. He's been calling for protests against Donald Trump. What a little snowflake. I played you some audio last week. All of the UK's media is giving him a platform, which I don't mind, free speech for everybody, but we have the right to ridicule him as well. Jones is desperately keen that thousands of people come out on the streets to, well, to protest Donald Trump. 
Trump. This is Jones speaking with a woman called Kate Garraway and I think a guy called Ben Shepard. This was Good Morning Britain from a couple of days ago. The United States is a, is a wonderful country. It's a country which is, you know, the country which millions fought against racism and, and, and mm. slavery and fought for civil rights. The majority of Americans, of course, abhor Donald Trump. Most Americans didn't even vote for him, as a, as a matter of fact. Look, the, the right to freedom of expression and protest is one of our most sacred rights. Our ancestors fought mm. and died for it. And, you know, if Donald Trump chooses to uh, speak of sexually assaulting women, of grabbing them by their genitals, and has numerous sexual harassment and assault accusations against him, if he chooses to talk of Mexicans as rapists and criminals, if he talks about Muslims, uh, a quarter of the world's population, of course, many of our fellow citizens are Muslims, uh, with racist generalizations, including, of course, being called racist by his own party, the Republican Party, who have very different views from my own. And if he chooses to promote a British fascist organisation like Britain First by retweeting <clears throat> their racist videos, then we have our right to express our abhorrence of those views he and everything that he stands for. That mm. No, he didn't. Well, he, he didn't did. apologise. Well, he, he, he said he would. He would consider apologising, uh, but in any case, he has a history of retweeting racist and white supremacist accounts, and indeed described white supremacists in America as very fine people. So, Charlie, so, mm. it's not just Owen. Owen loves a protest. Um, <laughs> it's all sorts of. You do. I mean, don't you? love a protest. You're <laughs> it's an old doing British it. tradition. It's, proud proud. Hey, it's, it's fun. So you set your tent up a little bit of music. Get in there. Fantastic, uh, Kate Garraway. You love a protest don't you Owen you do you love a protest I despise Owen Jones and I I, I, I I revile him I am repulsed by his existence but I would never deny him the rights to speak publicly and to air his opinions problem is what Jones is trying to do and others like him they are trying to eliminate eliminate anything which doesn't go along with their narrow cultural Marxist progressive way of thinking. They want to deplatform silence. They want to exile people. They want people to be held up. And I used the word reviled a second ago. They want people who think a certain way to be reviled. And by doing that, they are bringing in an insidious type of self-censorship where people will not say what it is they think they will not say what it is they feel, lest they be identified as being racist, bigoted, misogynistic, anti-Semitic, whatever the hell it is. This is terrifying. This is purely Orwellian and fascist to its core. It really is. And I'm going to play you some audio from the film Porky's. I never thought in nearly 20 years of producing and presenting programmes that I would ever say that <laughs> to make a serious point but I'm going to do it and I, I'm going to talk about tolerance just for a very brief minute because we are surrounded by people who think differently to us we are surrounded by people who hold opinions that we would be annoyed by we might be angered by we might be very surprised by we might be disgusted by we are surrounded by people who have opinions about people whom are from a different ethnic background to them. We don't like those opinions. We don't agree with them. But otherwise, these people are good people. They, they serve in our shops. They serve in our bars. They work in the same jobs as us. They share the same public transport as us to go to work. Otherwise, they are good people. They think differently to us. We might say the way they think is wrong. But that's okay, isn't it? Isn't it? We should put up with that. They should be entitled to think what they want to think. There's an amazing scene in the film Porky's. It's in the locker room. And there's a young... They're all high school students in the film. Um, 16, 17 years old. They're supposed to be. 18, I think. And there's a Jewish kid called Brian Schwartz. And he's new to the school. And um, he's an easygoing type of kid. And there's another kid called Tim Kavanagh. And Tim um, keeps insulting the Jewish kid. He uses insulting words towards him and he tries to ostracise him. And Tim is not happy that his own friends are nice to the Jewish boy. So there's a scene in the locker room where, the, where Tim is insulting Brian Schwartz, the Jewish kid. Have a listen to 
the scene and then yeah just listen to this this is where the Jewish kid is being insulted anybody want to go fly a kite with me tonight I think it's great weather for flying kites I wonder if there are any kites around here we can fly hey listen Kavanaugh it's not kites it's kike k-i-k-e kike do you know you're too stupid to even be a good big ass? Get out of the gym, Jew boy! As soon as the coaches are gone, Jew boy! Suit yourself. <clears throat> yeah, so Tim says as soon as all the coaches are gone, we're going to get it on in the um, in the parking lot. So they get it on, and the Jewish kid, Brian, gets the upper hand before the fight is broken up. And Tim Kavanagh, the young lad, walks away in a rage... Um, and I think he might refer under his breath he might say something anti-Jewish again but what's really interesting is the conversation that Tim's friends then have with the Jewish boy Brian Schwartz listen to Tim's friends speaking with the Jewish kid after the fight this is very profound amazingly for, for, for a film that you know basically a crass sexual comedy. Listen to this conversation. Look, Brian, Tim's our buddy, but you gotta understand he's got problems. Yeah, I noticed. See, it's real easy for him to take it all out on you because he thinks you're putting him down. He's not a bad guy. He's a prick. You're right, he's a prick. He's a smug. What? A smug. That's Jewish for prick, right? Yes, sort of. Yeah, well, anyway, even though he's a schmuck and uh, we don't like everything he does, but he's still our buddy, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I understand. That's incredibly profound in this day and age. He's a schmuck and he does things that we don't like, but he's our friend. He's our friend. So we tolerate him. We put up with him. We disagree with him. We'll argue with him. But he's our friend. And what the Owen Joneses of this world... And Jones is only a tool of this plan. He, he Of the cabal behind this plan. What everybody else wants to do. What the people behind this agenda want to do. Is they want to end the notion. That it's okay. To be associated with people who have views that the establishment has decided are dangerous, are hateful, or are racist. And that's a profound scene from a, from, from, from a very hysterically funny film, it must be said. Although the PC brigade would watch Porky's now and they'd probably fucking die of a heart attack, right? They'd say it's misogynistic and everything else. It had its place and it does have its place, that sort of comedy, if that's what makes you laugh. But that scene was profound. He's a schmuck and he's a prick. But you have to understand, Brian, he's our friend. And Brian, Jewish kid, says, of course, I understand. He's your friend. That's okay. It's exactly seven and a half minutes to the top of the year. I'm not going to labour the point there. I do want to, before um, we run out of time, I do want to nod to that sensational press conference in at the OPCW headquarters in The Hague on Thursday where Hassan Diab, the young boy, uh, spoke to the assembled media and said that basically the chemical weapon attack on the 7th of April was in fact staged. That it wasn't... Um, when, when, when he was shown in a video having water poured over his head, he hadn't actually been attacked or he hadn't um, been um, exposed to any chemical agent. Have a listen to the young boy. You'll then hear a doctor called Dr. Khalil al Joyce who was at the hospital that day. We were in the basement and then heard someone outside scream, go to hospital. We were scared. They started to pour water on me. I don't know why they did this. Pundits and politicians who've never been to Syria swear it happened. Witnesses, locals who were there in the hospital in question, say they didn't see a thing. All they saw was white helmets dousing confused civilians with water. Neither did the doctors see anything. 
On the 7th of April, I was in the emergency room treating patients injured during the fighting. The same day, around 7 p.m., we started receiving patients with breathing problems, about 15 cases. This happened because people were inhaling smoke and dust. They only showed symptoms of choking and nothing more. It all happened because one missile hit a building nearby and a lot of dust got into the hospital rooms. The screams, chemical weapons, chemical weapons, were used to create panic. This lasted for about an hour. We were treating the patients and then sending them home. We had no fatalities or instances of people suffering from poisonous substances. This isn't helping. Western journalists, their leaders, insist it happened. Syria, Russia and locals insist it didn't. Yeah, because it didn't. I think the idea now that chemical weapons were used by the government either on the 7th of April this year, um, a few weeks ago, or last year, or earlier this year, or any other time, have been widely debunked. Now, I'm going to say this before I leave. Um, last year, and recently, I've been critical of certain so-called independent journalists. Not critical of them personally, because I never met them. And I have nothing against them. Uh, they might be very nice people, I have no problems with it. But I'm a journalist, and what I do in this programme is I try to present an alternative point of view to an audience that would get their information from the mainstream. And I have said before, and I will say it again, people who claim to be independent journalists, but at the same time say that the, their biggest honour was meeting the president of Syria. People who claim to be independent journalists, but also claim themselves as defenders of Syria, are not journalists. They are spokespersons for the Syrian government and for the Russians. That's all they are. Now, I don't have any problem with that. No problem with it. But don't claim to be independent. Don't claim to be objective. When you send a message on Facebook to another activist claiming that the Syrian president told you about torture, but that you were going to keep it quiet because you didn't want that information to get into the hands of Syria's opponents. You are a worthless fucking propagandist, Vanessa Bealey. That is all you are. You're not a journalist. You never were a journalist. You never will be a journalist. Now, I get sick to the back teeth of people telling me, as long as what Bealey and Bartlett are saying is right, it doesn't matter. It does matter. It does matter. And of course, I would agree with much of what these people say. But it does matter because the information is compromised. It is tainted. You can't claim to be a defender of Syria on the one hand and then say you are an independent journalist on the other hand. And it is wretched practice by RT to put these people on the air day in and day out and call them independent journalists. They are the furthest fucking thing from independence you will ever get. Now this ain't personal. It never was, it never will be. This is my opinion. And by the way, the goon who posted an address on Twitter the other day, urging somebody to come and see me, that person... I have no doubt, has nothing to do with the Bartlett's and the Bealey's of this world. It's not their problem, that. Right? That guy was a fool. That's being dealt with. But I'm not going away. I'm like a fucking plague. Don't be getting teams of five, six and seven people to troll me. I couldn't give a shit. I'm a real radio presenter. I've been doing this for years and years. A lot tougher, a lot bigger and a lot nastier people have tried to uh, shut me up and tell me I can't say what it is I want to say. Laughable the notion that I'm somehow uh, uh, some sort of double agent who, who wants to suppress the truth about Syria. I've done more in interviewing CIA agents, in interviewing other journalists over the last five fucking years, including on television in London, to get the truth about Syria out and who's really responsible for what's going on in Syria. Far more than the puppet propagandists Bealey and Bartlett have ever done. Doesn't matter if what they're saying is true. If you say that the president of Syria told you about torture, but you're going to keep it quiet, you're either a liar, a fantasist, 
Because A, he didn't tell you that, or B, if that's the truth, you are a propagandist by saying you won't put that information out there. By the way, every army in history has committed human rights abuses against people. The Syrian army would be no different if torture has happened than the UK, the US, France, Germany, Italy, so on, so on, so on, so on, so on. Syria is under siege. It's in the middle of an attempted coup by neocon Zionists. That is clear. But information put in the public domain by people who claim to love the Syrian president, people who call themselves defenders of Syria, ain't journalists and I cannot use that information. That's the end of that, right? You want to come after me, these people? Don't make me laugh. I'm going to love you and leave you. Um, I really enjoyed the show today, by the way. Thank you for tuning in. I'm back with you on Tuesday. I think it's the 9th of May or the 8th of May because next Monday, tomorrow week is a bank holiday. So it's going to be Tuesday. Um, look, um, I'll miss you, but I really need the break. It's, um, it's 82 or 83 shows since the new year. It's just me. You know it is. 16 hours a day putting this out and I'm knackered and I need a break. I always take a week in the spring and I'll take two weeks late in the summer. Look after yourselves and one another. Don't forget about me. I'll be back real soon. Thanks to Simon for looking after the YouTube channel. I love Simon, by the way. Top man. Top man. Say that, Simon. Thinking of you today, pal. Um, and I'll see you on Tuesday, the 8th of May, leaving you with some um, Beach Boys. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Thanks for thinking this programme worth listening to. I really mean it. I love you. I'll see you soon. Bye.